I'm Alexandra Kreis and you're listening to Outer Travel in a Journey. Journeying now for 30 years into the life and practice of yoga, I have met many who have taken interesting turns, went past extraordinary bumps and reached unexpected places. People with whom I shared conversations about everyday struggles, intimate realizations, larger questions, ideas and dreams. So today I'm passing on the mic to one of them so we could hear and celebrate the wisdom in people's differences and experiences. Hello, a very well, warm welcome to Outer Travel in a Journey with my current guest, Sarah Kempel. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Alex. So nice to be here. Ah, it's good to have you. It's really a pleasure and a really amazing pleasure. I would never have thought that I stumble across somebody like you, to be honest, really. I've watched this movie um, ages ago about the deep diving. What's the name? You're probably familiar with it. The, the deep blue in Rausch der Tiefe. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <sighs> that really, yeah, it's very that, famous one. <laughs> yeah, that stuck with me. And this is why Sarah is here currently, dear listener. Um, Sarah is original British, but lives currently in Egypt in motion of transition to a new home where she's going to build a retreat and where she's going to lead um, retreats. Yeah, under the yeah, name of yeah. Discover Your Depths. And what yeah. you will discover in this interview is that Sarah has um, is a the world record holding deep free deep diver, and it's a woman. I'm so proud for us all. You know that it's a woman. I am so chuffed, and she's gonna talk a little bit with me and maybe further, um, you know, further along about how she integrates her spiritual teachings with her passion of deep diving. So. Yes, I'm looking so forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great introduction. Just to clear that up a little bit, I, I don't hold any world records at the moment. So um, I'm, I'm a, I think I'm perceived a little bit as the grandmother of free diving now. <laughs> there are a lot more younger women um, doing deeper dives, but I did hold, I held four world records and unofficially I was the deepest woman for I think six years it took for the next woman then to to catch up and and dive that deep but now there there's two in particular an Italian and a Slovenian woman who are incredibly strong but yeah I had um I had an amazing journey and as you say it was it was a really fascinating process for me to understand the spirituality of free diving the spirituality of the ocean I think a lot of people have a sense that the ocean has that quality for them. Um, I think that's why so many of us are drawn to the ocean for our holidays. But for me, it was a real, it was like a download of clarity of, you know, what the ocean really means to us as human beings and what we can learn from her. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and what is the quality that it requires to really dive that deep? That would be my first question, even though... Mm -hmm you already kind of jumped into the spiritual part, but, you know, just to go through the basics, um, because most of us are probably not deep diver listening to this. So yeah. let's just yeah. go to the facts of what is what in your business. Mm. Well, the first thing is, is that uh, it's, it's initially very counterintuitive because people come to free dive and, you know, they, they might see more advanced free divers. Firstly, just to explain to your listeners in case there's somebody who doesn't even know what it is, it's diving on breath hold. So just taking a deep breath in on the surface and going down, holding your breath, um, exploring. And it can be for competition, which is where I explored my uh, potential. And But it can also be recreational. People go snorkeling. Um, and for, for ever, human beings have free dived for sustenance, you know, foraging in the sea as a source of, of yeah, food. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, to go back to your to your question, I think the first thing, and this is why I say it's a bit counterintuitive, is relaxation. Because what we're asking people to do is to hold their breath and take themselves 
further and further away from the most vital source of life, which is the breath, the air. Um, and in order to dive deep, uh, you have to, one has to completely relax. And that requires the qualities for me that that requires is trust and surrender. Mm, wow. I, I can see myself booking already. <laughs> I'm going to come. Hold your feet, yeah. <laughs> um, the thing about the relaxation though is, I mean, I've been, I've been noticing the more I work with the breath to yoga and you are a yoga teacher as well. So, yeah. so we're in common territory is, that most people do it wrong or uh, you know like i assume that because i'm teaching it and i can see the tension in people's faces when they do what we call udiana this kind of um upward flying breath where you hold the retention below mm -hmm. the navel but the firmer you hold and the more you uh, contract it feels like the less you can hold the breath or the uh, implications of you holding it for that long are really bad like you're gasping like <gasps> you know that kind of stuff is yeah. that the same for deep diving is that... um yeah i mean the 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 reason why relaxation is so is really the the for me it's the foundation you know we talk about keystone habits the keystone aspect of free diving is relaxation and that's where it needs to start the reason for that is that when we're diving in the ocean the body has the impact of hydrostatic pressure so when now, as we're talking, we're at sea level, more or less, mm -hmm. and we say that we have one atmosphere of pressure on our bodies. So that means it's neutral. We can breathe in, we can breathe out. There's, there's no pressure that we perceive. As soon as I hold my breath and I go down just to 10 meters, that atmosphere of pressure doubles. I have then have two atmospheres of pressure on my body. Now, what that does to the air space is within my body is that they are halved as the pressure double, doubles the volume of the airspace is halves so if you think about your lungs inside of your rib cage if you start with say six liters already at 10 meters you only have three liters mm. and then at 20 meters that reduces and reduces and reduces and reduces incrementally boyle's law so anything really below about 40 meters the rib cage is a semi-rigid structure and so it's going to restrict the amount that your lung tissues can actually compress without being damaged and so in order to um, dive really deep without suffering injury it's like you have to receive this incredible embrace from the ocean for me, it's like it's the it's the it's the big hug. It's the, the the embrace of the divine down there. So it's really this is where the surrender comes in. It's like you cannot be the one controlling the dive. You cannot be the one doing the dives. You you really have to let go to the wisdom of your body and the fact that our bodies and the ocean know each other intimately, and they have done for millennia because that's that was our original home. And so free diving in order to really go go to the to, to the deeper depths 40 meters and beyond um, is a process of trusting that 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 wisdom and that intimacy is already there yeah. and surrendering the ego because of course we want to be in control we want to be the ones is anything going to happen do i have to fix something do i have to be no you just have to absolutely trust and surrender to the fact that your body already knows what to do. And, and, and as your lungs get smaller, you also become heavy. So then there's a point where you just start dropping into the ocean. Yeah. There's no effort required. It is pure surrender, pure letting go. So mm. is the, I mean, everybody who's probably tried to hold their breath for more than a minute, you know, feels like they, they are suffocating, but you're talking about actually the opposite it's almost like when you surrender and there is no struggle so what is the true struggle in going deeper and deeper i mean beyond that <laughs> you have to hold your yeah. breath i think the um and training has to be done conservatively because this adaptation to depth to this compression has to happen at a natural pace and there are people who push 
and uh, they're, they're the ones that end up with injury. So I think the struggle is much more uh, an internal one. And it's one where we really get uncompromising um, confrontation with ourselves and with everything which is not in alignment with spirit. Mm -hmm. So everything that the ego is bringing up to try to get involved in the process, to try to keep us safe, to try to push us forwards. It happens a lot when people are stuck on the numbers. So whether they, in their mind, they believe, you know, when I get to 50 meters, then I'm going to be a good free diver. Or when I get to this step, then I will have a national record or even a world record. When they get caught up in that, then the ego, of course, is, is involved because there's this pull to be something more than we are already. Hmm. Um, and the struggle is just to accept that if we're ready to go there, the body will go there. And it's not about us creating or forcing or doing anything. It's, al it's allowing. And so for us as Westerners living in the society, which is so much about do, go, create, acquire, become, you know, it's much more about it already is and just allow. And so the struggle is the struggle is the spiritual process of ego being, um, yeah, being released, I suppose. Yeah, as in so many yoga practices where we mm. find ourselves really kind of pushing, I mean, I suffered so many injuries and I know yeah. why, you know, because my yeah. ego wanted that and then I didn't let go. Uh, and then we we get the bill as my teacher used to say we get the bill yeah. for that so but tell us a little bit more how how did that come across you know how did that sport or that event mm -hmm. come across in your life what what has drawn yeah. you into free diving <laughs> I mean my story is pretty unusual from every um, aspect um, I think the reason that I had the success that I had was because I came to it through a very different path. I didn't, I had no desire, no desire at all. It was a student, one of my yoga students who I used to go swimming with who needed somebody to safety her. So the first rule of free diving is never dive alone because there are inherent risks of holding your breath underwater, particularly if you don't know what you're doing. So she needed somebody to be her buddy and she pestered me for an entire year she was water on a stone and she wore me down and eventually I said okay you know I'll do the beginner's course so that I can go to 20 meters I can do safety take care of you but I'm not interested in going any deeper yeah. and I signed up for this course and uh, as fate would have it the day that we were due to start the course we had um, a big bomb attack in the small town that I live in in Egypt Dahab this was in April 2006 and so we sort of postponed it by a couple of days and then we came to the course um, and I really had a sense of immense peace and of course because of what had happened in the community that that contrast was very very strong and very clear that down here there is silence down here there is peace if you scuba dive you have this constant <sighs> Put the sound of your own breath in the bubble <laughs> and with free diving it's you know it's gone it's just it's silence it's so beautiful and for me it was very much in line with my very first connection with my yoga path mm -hmm. I tried lots of yoga classes a few years before that and just couldn't connect with it I didn't get it mm -hmm. and then the first time I tuned in I, I teach kundalini the first time I tuned in was I, I literally had a spontaneous kundalini arising and I was like, whoa, what just happened? And the free diving for me was a similar but more peaceful version of that. Mm. Um, and anyway, to go back to your question, the, these bomb attacks sort of created a very difficult energy in the town. And I ended up with some friends creating just a circle where people could come and share because there was no support mm. for for the people who'd really been there as witnesses and, and tried to save lives and were suffering from trauma. 
So we created this circle, but I could feel that I was getting depressed and I could feel that the heaviness of what had happened was beginning to weigh on me. And I remembered from the days when I lived in London that I would have this depression come over me and be completely helpless to it mm. and know that I would be in this dark place and have, have no tools or no, no way to pull myself out of it. And so I said to a, f a friend who had done the beginner's course with me, let's just go in the sea. I need to kind of clear my mind and, and change my energy a bit. And I could really, I came out of that dive session with a sense of that was 50% of the darkness that lifted. Mm. It was really, I could wow. literally tangibly measure it. So I said, okay, let's go again tomorrow. I'm curious. <laughs> and the other 50% was gone. So for me, it was like, wow, if it's that easy to be happy, I'm just going to go in the ocean two, three times a week yeah. and dive. So my, my motivation was happiness. Mm. And so when I was going in the ocean with that as my intention, I was always in a space of openness. I was never in a space of contraction. And if you consider, if you're going in because I want to get to 20 meters or I want to get to 35 meters or I've got to, you know, fix this technique that isn't working it's you're totally in your head and your ego and your body contracts as a result which makes it harder to progress because of this interaction with the ocean and the pressure that we experience mm. so I was always in spirit I was in this opal playful curious place where it was like I'm just here to be happy you know it's and that's what the dolphins are doing yeah that's the that's the spirit of well, that's the energy of spirit. You know, it's this open playfulness. We're here to play. And so over the course of a very short period of time, um, I mean, if I, if I compress it, yeah. I, I had a period of seven months when I actually had hepatitis A, so I couldn't dive at all. Mm. But from that first course through to the, the competition, when I set my world records, was nine months. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that must have been a calling, so to speak. It was really, it was like, everyone was looking at me and I was also just going, well, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how I'm doing this. It was, you know, I was really, I was just playing yeah. and I was in that space of, yeah, I'm having fun. That's a curious thing. I mean, you mentioned that before you had no desire, you know, and in between all the desires we have, um, Sarah and I met in a workshop where we kind of talked about deeper dreams and, you know, where, mm -hmm. where it's very much around, like, are our desires, are they sometimes, the, as I say, say the, um, the shreyas or the pray, um, players, you know, are they, are they disciplined or are they just desires what we have? And what I hear you saying is that you weren't aware of that desire, you know, because we all trying to follow our desires you know if I want to learn an instrument I follow that desire you know so mm. where is that connecting for you to to that aspect of deeper dream yeah uh, I think this is really where we start to get into the dynamics between the ego and the spirit mm. um, because if the desire comes from spirit it's really we we are guided towards something which is in our path and which is for our expansion. Um, but often we are, we're, we get attached to desires through ego. Mm. Um, so in the example of free diving, my desire was happiness. My desire was play. Mm. My desire was never a national or a world, certainly not a world record. That was mm. like, way off my spectrum of that's my possible in my lifetime um so it was really my desire was the feeling and I think that that is where we can really make a quantum shift in our experiences mm -hmm. and I see this when I work with our students is that we have a we have like specific days where we're working we start with the body then the mind then the spirit and on spirit day there is almost always this shift where I ask them to dive for the quality that they feel is missing in their life. Mm -hmm. So for me, in that first phase, it was happiness. For me, when I actually I came back to free diving after my mother died, and I had a I had a very dark period after those first world records. Mm -hmm. um, 
where I went into a deep depression. And when I came, or my process of coming out of that deep depression was joy. I realized I'd lost my joy. So in that second phase of diving, which is when I did my 104 meters, the only thing I was focusing on was joy. And I see this with our students, like what is the thing that's missing in your life? Mm. But it has to be an essence of spirit. It has to have that quality of expansion and lightness. And what I'm and hearing when, is, sorry to sorry. interrupt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I'm hearing you say between the first uh, encounter with depression, you were talking a little bit of feeling depressed after the attack and the encounter of hearing all the devastating news. And then you came into a deeper depression through uh, experienced death, which is something that we truly, truly avoid as a subject uh, in our lives, even though everybody says, yeah, I'm aware I'm dying. I think we're not so acutely aware as we think. And we often kind of go through the emotions when somebody close by dies. So, so that's yeah. what you're saying is that what I'm hearing you saying is that sometimes, even though the world is dark for us and in us, we cannot grab the tools that we need to grab. I, w I was wondering at that very moment when you said that story, you know, like, why did you not go diving as you felt so much improvement the first time? And then I thought mm. maybe it's due to the process we all have to go through and not miss. Is, was that what happened to you or why did you not get there? Yeah, I remember hmm, maybe about four months after my mother's death going in and diving. And actually I found it traumatizing. The breath hold yeah. uh, for me was too intense when it, when I was in that still very close space of grieving and processing what had happened. Um, so I, I could recognize at that moment, I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. I'm really not ready to, to do this now. I did come back the next year, but it was a forced. I mean, if, you know, I talk about, oh, people, when they force it, this is what happens. I did it. So I know firsthand, I came back the year after and I was like, right, got to do another world record, got to, you know, be Sarah Campbell and prove to the world that I'm still in the game. And I did do another world record. It was my last official world record and it was horrible. It was mm. absolutely horrible experience. Wow. I did not enjoy any moment of the competition, of the community, of the ocean, nothing. So, um, The, this this contrast between like you know what the desire and and how do we sort of um, motivate ourselves to move forwards I think we really need to look for the quality and where that desire and motivation comes from I mean I with my students I talk about a positive and a negative motivation and I think from that place we can maybe connect more readily with the fact that am I motivated to do something because I need approval from outside, because mm -hmm. I perceive that there's a lack within me that needs to be filled. And if that's the motivation, then it's always going to have some form of contraction around it because it's coming from a place of, I'm not enough as I am. Whereas the positive motivation is, I am perfect as I am, and I'm just here to play and experience and explore. That sort of that curious mind, which mm. is what we talk about a lot in yoga, is sort of the beginner's mind of just, I'm here to receive. Yeah. And that's the very, very, you know, my, des my desire is to grow and receive. And, but specifically in the direction of exploring my potential in the ocean or exploring my potential at, on the mat or exploring my potential in my relationship. It's like that quality of curiosity and, and openness that that's where the desire needs to come from. Yeah, and where the tools are sometimes not valid. You know, that's what I'm hearing. I think we all, everybody who's listening and myself included, you know, we all have come to try to apply what we read is good for us. And then, as you say, you know, it becomes heartless. And instead, we need to really culture a movement where we are ready to to be in the day as we are and really in in that being with the day as it is you know is it a good day is it a bad day what is coming up for me what is it that i really want to do so not completely impulsive but really kind of guided from the connection into myself you know, instead mm -hmm. of 
trying to do something to escape from myself. And then sometimes you, we might be surprised. That's what happened to me the past four years. You know, I was surprised in what I wanted to do instead of what I thought I needed to do. Mm-hmm. My regular yeah. practice this way, my regular uh, chanting this way, this is good, this is bad. In all these labels, we become so so much less than more. You know, as you said, you know, the label of having held the, the record, you know, wasn't a, a good label for you anymore any longer. It sounded like that for a moment to me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it's such a tricky thing. But the the the, the one thing that really struck me about the free diving process is that this relationship that the body has with the ocean um, is gives us really um, honest feedback. And, you know, what you were just talking about was, you know, I could, I could do the practice that I've learned, or I can actually check in with myself and see how I feel and see what my body wants to do on the map today. Um, the, and that's, that's a great level of awareness to bring to practice. The thing is with the ocean is that if you, no, I'll take a step back. If you to do that on the mat and you kind of say, yes, no, I'm going to do what my body feels like, but then there's still that element of, but you know, there is this posture that I really want to nail. And so at some moment or some point, the energy of the mind, the body may just be in this process of, yeah, feeling good, but the mind is still going through yeah, but you know, I want, I want this, I'm doing this, but it's still not enough. I still need more. I still, there's that agitation, that, that sense of not enoughness in the mind that on an energetic level is transferred into the body. Even if the postures are still gentle, we're still in our yin practice or whatever it might be in the ocean, that energy of the mind Mm. is in the body. And that relationship between the ocean and the body you're going to feel it and you're going to not be able to dive deeper. So there's this absolute honesty, which we receive from the ocean, which we don't get anywhere else in our lives. Hmm. We get it from the wall in yoga. That's what I learned. You know, if you practice with the wall and the floor, you get a lot of honesty about what you can and cannot do. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Think about it. Um, But yeah, I mean, the ocean is much gentler in its, uh, you think it's much gentler but it's probably not if you think about the pressure that you it's yes I mean you you don't physically hurt yourself but it's the it's the emotional confrontation that you get you know of why can't I do this what you know what am I doing that's wrong why can't I go where I want to go and it's because you're in a space of forcing it you're in a space of needing it too much you're needing it as an affirmation that you're okay Mm -hmm. you're okay already you don't need another meter or another 10 meters or a, or a title to be okay. You are okay as you are. And the ocean, I mean, it's absolute love. Mm. But for many people who, are, who, haven't, who haven't managed to let go of this not enoughness and this need for more, it's, it can be a very painful process to go through because the ocean doesn't say, oh, all right then, yeah, today I'll just let you pretend. No. <laughs> There's no pretending, you know, it's absolute, it's absolute honesty. And so we have to be ready to receive and be able to process that level of honesty about ourselves and how we are, how we're working with ourselves. And this is, this is what I love about my work in particular is because the free diving education is brilliant. You know, it creates safe, competent free divers, technique. Mm. It doesn't have a clue about this whole relationship body mind spirit Mm. and for me that's where my work is um is so important you know because free divers who do want to progress very often it's a mental blockage or an emotional blockage that is stopping them which they can't figure out on their own Um, but also you know i love the fact that we can work with people who come to us for healing that they have a relationship, they have a connection with the ocean and they, they recognize that this is a very deeply healing place where the, the clarity that they can get on themselves and on the beliefs that are sabotaging them can really come to the surface um, in a way that is much more efficient and powerful than in, in regular talk therapy. And um, it, it's, it's always 
I mean, one week, I'm always blown away by by the transformation that we see in people. It's so beautiful. Yeah. So two questions here for you. The one mm. is, um, who would you recommend not to go deep diving? Is there something that has kind of <laughs> shown up in your world or is a general recommendation from deep diving or from your experience? Um, I wouldn't say... I mean, if, you know, if I were to kind of, you know, look at the, the typical um, type of person that is a risk in the water, they're the people who, um, who are solely focused on the goal mm. and they don't care about the journey and they don't care about, you know, their own process or the process of other people. Because, of course, if you're safetying somebody who's a risk, there's a risk for yourself and you carry in a way the responsibility for their life. And mm. that's not a, a thing to be taken lightly. So if I sense that somebody is a, an overt risk taker, I won't, I won't take them. Um, but I think that there's a place, anyone who is open and willing to learn, anyone who is open um, to being a little bit humble, mm. there is, there's an ex there's a very powerful experience to be had in the ocean so i i wouldn't like to put it in a box and say these mm. kind of people should never come um i mean even people who have water trauma my mm. partner had a very near drowning when he was a, a child yeah. and he's been working through that and he's now an instructor wow and um so it's it's also even for people who have had a traumatic experience in the water working in in this way is a way of rewiring the nervous system very gently helping people through that pattern which has got blocked in their psyche and in their nervous system it helps them to rewire and, and release that and stuff. my second question thank you so much i think that is a good indicator and the second question is most fun story from your retreats is there a story that you remember most fondly <laughs> that makes you chuckle oh my goodness um oh i gosh off the top of my head um i would say oh yeah we have a lot um i think more than sort of fun it's 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 sort of the moments when i am deeply touched when i see somebody have that moment of realization about themselves in the water and you can you can just see that they have released a whole load of weight and often it's like they're coming up from a dive and they've got this ridiculous smile grin on their face and on the surface they're either laughing hysterically or they're crying hysterically <laughs> but it's that massive emotional release yeah. um yeah. that comes it's almost, it sounds like a rebirthing process, you know, if they let go, you, you talked about uh, letting go underwater, seeking something that brings back, you yeah. know, how we are the original state and yeah. Okay. That's it's very much. Yeah. I mean, the ocean, you know, the ocean is ultimately our home. So it's yeah. really a, a going back to, to source and then being being rebirthed again yeah that's so funny i said yesterday to my husband that i prefer <laughs> i prefer the mountain but i don't prefer the ocean i have no connection to water <laughs> i'm ready to come I'd, I'd say to that right now <laughs> so um yeah is the, when can we expect to to be able to book with you what do you think how long it'll take until yeah uh, I mean, these are strange times, so I, I can't put a I can't put a date in the calendar yet. Um, but we are. I, I mean, I'm planning on on relocating in December, mm -hmm. and depending on how quickly we can get set up and have have a retreat base, then I would hope for spring that we would be able to accept guests. And even if it's not for, for the free diving, if we have space, then we're going to welcome people to come and stay and just yeah. experience the, the, the beauty of this island. How much virus can you get underwater? That's my question, you know. <laughs> How what? 
how how much of the virus can you receive under the water? Ah. I don't think any, right? No. It's not Corona like... doesn't swim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was my little nasty client <laughs> comment. Yeah, uh, yeah. The situation, but I am so honored again, you know, to to have witnessed this conversation with you and listening to you and all your journeying, and I wish you so much luck with your you know change of location and that it brings fruitful things to your life and that you can be of service to all of us who are intrigued like i am oh well thank you so much alex it's been a real pleasure to spend this time with you one-on-one -on -one. and um yeah i'm i i mean i i just feel very grateful that for whatever reason i received the these experiences and this wisdom through my through my practice and through the ocean and i'm able to share it so life is it's like a, a box of chocolate you never know what you get you know comes to mind <laughs> yeah i never i never saw that one coming so <laughs> beautiful yeah so let's say goodbye thank you for listening bye bye if you enjoy listening to my podcast, please consider to become a patron at patreon.com slash Alexandra Kreis and pledge your donation.